The next session, India and the world. May we invite Naman Ahuja onto the stage and Miss Nivedita Menon onto the stage. If this promises to be a scintillating discussion on the landmark exhibition and book, India and the World. While talking about this exhibition, Naman said, there was a conscious effort made to include women's perspectives in shaping the history of the world. Nivedita is a feminist writer and professor of political thought at JNU. She is known to take positions on political issues, including nuclear power and the Kashmir conflict. India and the world. Thank you very much. Sorry? A timer, sir. Um, so from the last session, we get this memorable phrase, erotic pursuit in defense of the nation. And as two professors from JNU, I cannot tell you how thrilled we are to reclaim the title of nationalist very proudly. Naman and I were just talking about it. If that is what defense of the nation means, we are nationalists. We're nationalists. Nobody can accuse us of treason anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. I think that was the most marvelous uh, window um, good challenge for us to be able to start our session today and you've raised a whole heap of questions for us to be able to look into. Um, the exhibition India and the World was staged at the CSMVS formerly called the Prince of Wales Museum in Bombay last year and then it moved to the National Museum in Delhi and it was shown over there for about two months. It was a landmark exhibition because it was the first time that a foreign museum, in this case the British Museum, agreed to lend 120 plus objects to India. We've always borne the burden that India has lent its art to museums all over the world. We go to museums whenever we go abroad and we see fantastic displays which are extremely informative, aesthetically stimulating, we learn about not just the cultures that we are visiting but oftentimes more about India and its history when we are in those museums than we have opportunity to do in our own country with our collections. And so as a form of redress, it was suggested that India shouldn't just be lending its art to the rest of the world, but are we finally capable of showcasing the rest of the world's art and history in our institutions for our public? So with that brief, we entered into collaboration with the British Museum to lend us Um, this is a request. Would you please maintain some silence because a lot of people can't hear those who are on the dais. Thank you. Thank you very much. So one of the issues when you're trying to write a history is that although a dominant chapter in history might be about what kind of a government we had, or what was the nature of governance or the state. You might have a section on trade and economic history, but equally within that writing of history, people have other questions. What was the role and the status of people? What was the nature of day-to-day -day exchange? What was the role of gender or the history of erotica? Um, how was it being played out at that time and how can you read that within a history of economic relations or the nature of the state at that time? What rules were there that governed it? And so there was a subtext to the entire exhibition, which was about trying to read a history of gender and try and create a more empowering history into an economic history or a political history that might be used as curricula in textbooks in India. Um, thank you, Naman. Actually, the before I saw this fabulous work, which uh, before it came to Delhi, I had already come across Naman's rereading of an image that we are all very familiar with from school onwards, 
which is the little statue of what we always call the dancing girl of Mohenjo-daro. And um, I read an interview with him uh, in after the Bombay exhibition in which uh, Naman said he reread this image and uh, can we maybe show that slide? Uh, at some point he will show the slide and he'll, he'll talk about it a little bit himself. But what is interesting is that he rereads um, this particular image not as a dancing girl at all. He interprets the way she, there it is, she, he interprets uh, her, her hand, which is loosely held like this, as having possibly held some kind of weapon. In other words, he rereads it as possibly a woman soldier. And what occurred to me when I saw this particular interpretation was that it is no less plausible than the assumption that any woman with a standing with a hand on her hip has to be a dancing girl. In other words, when we look at images of any sort, we look at them through the prejudices and the social networks of our time. And at some point, archaeologists viewed any woman as simply existing for the pleasure of men, a dancing girl. But by the time we come into the 21st century in a world that has been shaped decisively by feminism, Naman produces another reading of this image. So the question that occurs to me, and I'll toss it back to Naman just now, is that when we claim tradition, uh, in the last session Shabariwala was mentioned, but all communities claim tradition. What is this tradition that we are talking about? because traditions are constantly reinvented. There are also traditions that are marginalized and traditions that are claimed. For example, in Shabarimala, there are traditions of uh, backward castes and tribal people performing rituals. Those, they, they have now been marginalized. So why are those traditions not being claimed? The tradition of women not being permitted to enter the temple is relatively new. Why is that tradition being claimed as tradition? So there's a whole way in which we would have to read even texts like the Kama Sutra, which we had such a scintillating discussion of in the last session, with a 21st century lens. In other words, there is no other way that we can enter tradition. We can only enter tradition through the point at which we are. Traditions are fluid. So I'll toss this question to Naman so that he can talk about this a little bit. I think, yeah, it is very difficult uh, to be able to address this. The reason is, tradition is hugely empowering. It informs us about our identity. If things happened a particular way in history, it's easier for us to be able to say that this is part of our culture and we must therefore own that identity. And that is very empowering and it needs research to be able to constantly dig out that more empowering history and to be able to make history more relevant to the present. And it was with that intention that I tried to do a rereading of The Dancing Girl of Mohenjo-daro because looking at the sculpture, you see that she wears all her bangles on her left arm, which is held on her thigh, and her right has only a bracelet at her wrist. She hands, she stands with her head cocked backwards and there's a slant to her body at an angle. Now as any student of sculpture will know that if you really wanted to balance that sculpture out in some way, if I just inserted a stick or a spear in that hand, her left hand, which incidentally has a socket, if you handle the piece, you'll see that it hangs at an angle which exactly balances the extension on the other side. And I began to wonder, why is this person who's keeping her right working arm free, as every woman knows, bangles get in the way of work, and she's loaded all her bangles onto her left arm, she obviously needs to keep her working arm free for some reason and not wear all the bangles, and if she's a dancing girl, Surely it must have been necessary for her to be equally adorned on all sides 
and to wear bangles on both arms. And the fact that her dancing nature began to make me wonder, when did this name come up? And reading through archaeological survey reports and history books, it turns out that this is more reflective of the bias of the writers of the early 20th century, who felt that images of women should either be called dancing girls, there for the pleasure of men, or they should be called Parvati or some other Devi or some goddess, there for the worship of men. And those became the two debates constantly with article after article being written about her and fights in the media that shall we call her a goddess or shall we call her an apsara? And it seems that there can't be any space for a woman to exist in Indian history as a working woman, just as somebody who is capable of being a soldier or being a warrior. And it's not that unusual to have female soldiers. There were others, and even today, the very idea of Bharat Mata is invoked time and again through imagery um, to be able to fulfill those roles, problematic though it may be. Now that slide is not very clear, but I don't know if you can see it, but it's a memorial made to a female soldier in the Kakatiya domain in Andhra Pradesh, and it shows a a woman in a short skirt with a blade at her throat. Every time somebody would be martyred, the memorial that would be erected in their memory would not show them as having fallen to the enemy in war, but invariably show them as somebody who sacrificed themselves in service of the country. And the fact that there are memorials to women from medieval times, just as there are hero stones and memorial stones to men is something that hasn't been talked about very often. So it was relevant to try and bring out these examples from history and try and show them together. But the problem for me was that when doing this, however empowering it may be, there is still a level of patriarchy that is implicit even in such a sculpture. And the reason for that is that if you look at it carefully, you'll see that on top, I'm sorry, on this uh, projection you can't make out, but there are two figures above her on the left and right. From the Mahabharata onwards, the story is that soldiers, when they would die in battle, would go up to heaven where they would meet any number of apsaras who would be waiting for them. When the woman soldier dies, would she get the equivalent of apsaras waiting for her? Or would that be allowed or would that not be allowed? And it's not allowed because the cultural depictions tend to show that there are apsaras waiting for her too. And there's not, and this would come up in my classes with my students because they would say that, well, why was it that the festival to karma and I agree, we must revive one. But why did the festival to Kama stop in about the 4th century? There was a big maha or a festival that used to be held in ancient India. And there was a great pillar that would be erected and people would dance around that totem pole. And we have accounts for it from ancient literature. But somehow it seems that after about the 4th century AD, that festival seems to have been eradicated. Why is it that when you read the Kama Sutra, however liberating it may be, it seems to follow that it's ultimately a text that is written by a man. When you come to the good manners, the man has to be able to speak to the woman in her language, which is Prakrit, because the woman isn't allowed to speak in Sanskrit. Where are the voices of sexual freedom and good manners written by women and those texts aren't available and so when we are talking about how mobilizing tradition is tradition can also if you read it carefully can also be stifling and it doesn't actually serve our intentions always and that's what these artworks were meant to display that there is a certain 
normative way, a heteronormative and a certain normative way in which society has been created and our identities have been shaped. So from Ming China, for instance, this was a huge scroll that showed what were the courtly activities of women. And women over here are allowed to do such things as tend to the garden, do a little bit of embroidery, look after their children, create little, go around the scholar's rocks in their garden and tend to them. There's nothing decisive that women are meant to do really. Or in this shield made at about the same time from Udaipur, the Maharanas of Mewar depict what is the right and correct action for a, for a Rajput man and how it informs the notions of masculinity. It's painted in what we call the fabulous Neem Kalam style, which is all in shades of gold. It's painted on rhino hide. This fantastic shield lies in the National Museum in Delhi. It's divided into eight paintings, the art prahar, the eight times of a day. And our soldier, the valiant king, leaves his palace, goes to the temple, bows before it, carries on, shoots a tiger, carries on, finds a woman bathing in a pond, whisks her off, has his way with her. In the next scene, he carries on, sits in a machan, shoots a few more animals, and he carries on like that, hunting, shooting, fornicating through the day, till he eventually goes back home to his palace, and all the women of his palace are supposed to line up with their thals in their hands, waiting for him to come back and welcome him back into their lives. And it's all in a day's work, which is what is depicted on this shield. And so you realize that tradition works both ways. It extends certain normative patriarchal notions of femininity and machismo as much as it can be given a more liberated reading if we are willing to excavate that kind of a history. So, Norman, I, um, I would like to ask you to reflect upon um, how something reaches us as tradition, in the sense that uh, there are, there's a particular way in which history is produced. There are certain resources that we have access to because certain texts are translated, certain texts are not translated. Uh, for example, in the 19th century, uh, the Gita is discovered. Uh, in the 19th century, the Bhakti tradition is discovered in India. And there's a way in which the Bhakti tradition is written about and talked about and the Gita is written about and talked about in order that a certain kind of nationalism uh, and a certain idea of India can be produced in the 19th century. So in other words, the Bhakti tradition existed, but we get it or we get into it through a nationalist discourse of the 19th century. So similarly, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the ways in which the images uh, and, and resources of culture that we have access to are also, ref they also reflect the very strong masculinist uh, interests of the 18th to the 20, 20th centuries. In other words, where are the texts by women? We do have, of course, Susi Taru and Lalita's Women Writing in India. Yeah. We have now that wonderful series in the Murti, Murti Library uh, with the songs of the Buddhist nuns um, yes. that, uh, that, and so on. So I wanted you to talk a little bit about the silences uh, and the ways in which uh, women's voices, whether of desire or action, are simply not available for us. So for every such uh, account that Naman just told us about the life of the Rajput ruler, there would be probably oral accounts at least, or possibly even written texts, which um, we don't have access to, of women either celebrating their sexuality or with, with one another. Uh, if, you are, if I see Apsaras above, um, above a female soldier, I see that as a subversion of heteronormative desire straight away. Uh, it's not possibly a mistake at all in the sense of it's not like you have the same iconography and stick a woman soldier's picture there. So we know that uh, there are very many traditions uh, of uh, non-heteronormative desire and all of that. And uh, where would one go to find those resources uh, and what is missing in your opinion um yeah exactly I mean, 
whenever Oops. is this on yeah okay <laughs> you know they they made a postage stamp of this sculpture uh, for many years and it sort of summarizes the problem that nivedita just raised this is a fabulous statue of a sura sundari or an apsara from the walls of khajuraho and this exquisite the seductive buxom woman uh coyly turning around was looked at as a great work of art from the indian museum in calcutta's collection where you see a woman from the back just turning around to look at us and it was always celebrated as a as a fantastic achievement by an indian artist to be able to make a figure like this and how empowering that the ancient indian woman is writing she holds a pen in her hand and she's scribbling something and it was looked at as a as an instance to show that how ancient indian women were literate and that's true and we began to try and find a context for a sculpture like this and say well how is it that this sculpture exists amongst all these other figures having sex on the walls of khajuraho why is this figure there amongst them and then i began to look at her carefully and i don't know if you can see on the slide but there are little crescent marks on her shoulder nail marks left by her lover into her flesh and then there are another set of nail marks on her neck and wherever i looked wherever the man had grabbed her um, or she'd been held there are nail marks that have been left in her flesh and as i began to look at all the other figures of khajuraho i realized they too carried these crescent nail marks on their bodies wherever they wherever they were they were held and you began to realize that these are pe people who have been motivated into the act of writing or composing poetry or singing or whatever they are doing driven to do it out of love and that's what khajuraho is all about and then came promptly the question in class so you're curating an exhibition on the body in indian art where is the eye candy for women all of these temples are covered with these beautiful buxom women for boys to look at what's there for the girls to look at and then came up the question on silences that we have extraordinary silences and we don't have answers to those questions because however liberating and mobilizing our tradition is it is still packed with extraordinarily large silences where financial agency to create these temples is in the hands of a certain male aristocracy that is that is patronizing these temples yeah so if so if i can quickly come in here then that perhaps then we need to be looking for uh these kinds of resources not in the big state patronized institutions such as temples because as we know in indian tradition temples and the state were very closely linked and the whole question of secularism is complicated in india for very many other reasons so rather than looking at these big state patronized uh institutions for female sexual autonomy perhaps we need to be looking in other places i guess what I, what i was saying so if i so i'd like you to just also reflect on the question of sexual autonomy uh particularly in the context of the last uh, panel which was absolutely fascinating where uh, it appears that where there, there was a way in which eroticism as such was celebrated without much reflection on power So I was thinking about for example one of the ma uh, the rules of manners that Gurcharan talked about was when you are kissed kiss back I think I would like to add if you like it if not slap the guy or the woman <laughs> uh, and I think the question of agency and autonomy uh, get erased in a kind of celebration of sexuality without reflecting on power Yes. So I was just wondering if maybe you could connect it to your last. Absolutely. I mean I think this is exactly why and we have to realize that these instances of seizing power are not new to our century. What I'm showing you behind me is a statue of a Jain Tirthankar 
who has been conceived as a woman. Now in the strict Jain tradition, women aren't allowed to achieve, women don't achieve moksha. The best a woman can do is to be reborn as a man so that in the next janam she can aspire to moksha. But certain Jain traditions and obviously a group of Jains in UP in the 12th century felt differently and they conceived a female Tirthankar as a woman. At some point it didn't suit the hierarchies within that establishment and she was beheaded and the sculpture was left out. It now lies in the Lucknow Museum. It's an extraordinary sculpture to be able to read that history into this piece, to be able to say that agency has come up time and again, and agency has also been suppressed. So I think that's some of the things. I had several other slides, but I think our time's... Our time's up, it says. Uh, so could we maybe take a couple of questions? Could we do that? Couple of questions from the audience. There's one here. Oh, Naman? Can we have the mic, please? Can we have the mic, please? Now, but may I ask you, uh, Nick, a, a question? You know, the lady. Uh, the the, 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 the 3,500 years old, you know, the, 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 the so-called dancing girl. So-called dancing girl. Um, she, she could be a warrior, but I think it's more likely that she's a huntress. Possibly, very possibly. And the reason why I say this is that I remember reading that in in, Khajara, in, 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 in Mahindadaro, of the eight layers that, of the city, instruments what that could have been instruments of war, were only found in the highest layer, the top layer, and that they weren't any beneath. And that's one of the most striking things in my life that I've ever read or seen. Or, you know, so I think I would I would suspect that she was she was a huntress, and that that would make much more sense of, of a different kind of equality, actually. Yeah, very very possible. Absolutely. I mean, the fact what I was interested in recuperating is that she might have a capacity for any kind of labor. She's somebody who is capable of working. It doesn't matter what that work is. She could be a hunter, she could be a soldier, she could, it could have been a staff of any kind, but the fact is that she keeps a working arm free to be able to do something with herself. Can maybe, we can maybe take one more? Yes. Well, you spoke about silences, which we need to uh, remember. I was thinking of another medium altogether, which is the folk song level. Indeed. And, and when, this is Durga Puja time, and you have the Agavani songs, which we've never really looked into so much as we do now, where there's this whole story of Parvati coming home, in Bengal at least. She comes home from a, from a, from a abusive husband who's always high, and she comes with the children to her parental home, and that these stories we the tales of how Shiva is coming to reclaim Parvati and the mother telling her that gosh she's already arrived now what do we do let's feed him with some mithai which is uh, you know which has got things in him to, to get into a stupa which they do and so on and so forth this whole thing and so in Bengal uh, Durga Puja really means a woman going to a parental home and being able to tell her friends about what she suffers at his hands he may be Shiva but whatever. So these are the things that we are now looking into quite a bit, which we didn't really. We still have three minutes, three, four minutes. Question. Yeah. Okay, maybe we'll just yeah. Uh, it was very interesting, your talk. Uh, I've been to your exhibitions. Now, uh, what I would like to comment on is that statue you showed with the, uh, the woman warrior with the two late Apsaras on either side. And he said, why doesn't she have eye candy? I think because she's very sensible. And uh, she'd much rather have two helpers because a woman has so many roles. So maybe somebody for the dishes, maybe somebody to look after the husband while she, you know, does what she wants to do. So perhaps uh, whoever made the sculpture thought like that. Thank you, it was a lovely talk.
Uh, of course, there's one more question. Should we, we don't have, I'm so sorry, we don't have time for any more questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are interested, the book might be available. It's published by Penguin. It accompanies the exhibition.